Welcome to the Marketing Main Podcast, where we talk all things marketing. My name is Mike Peters, your host, and today we have on the show Leigh Williams, the owner of Emerath Designs in Chattanooga. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Well, um, we're really thrilled that you are here then, uh, because we're in kind of like the same space um, as far as I knew this. And then, um, you know, tell us a little bit more in detail what you guys do, where you're located, especially what markets do you serve and, you know. You just said you just you guys just moved down here from Nashville, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just moved here from Nashville. We lived there for 23 years, and uh, now we're located in Chattanooga. So I'm just getting my feet on the ground networking and getting out there to tell people about our company and what we can do and, and just really trying to be a part of the community. Yeah, I mean, that's always a good idea, especially if you're new to town, right? Do you have any other, like, um, you know, Uh, ties to, to Chattanooga before? or Our daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughter live here. Okay, they live here mm -hmm. for a long time already? In Ottawa, or? yeah. Or, or okay. Yeah, for so about 10 years. I never know how to like pronounce that <laughs> city, to be honest. Uh, like it was like Ottawa, Ottawa, I don't, I don't know. I'm it means from... owl, that's all I know. Owl? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> um, so, uh, I never, I mean, like even people that are from here, I met people that are from here that pronounce that uh, little town totally different depending on who you talk mm -hmm. to. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm a foreigner. Um, what what am I going to say? But, you know, that's a that's a pretty place to live, like close yeah, to the Bay, nice. uh, Harrison Bay there. And, you know, uh, I like it. Um, so um, you do branding and corporate identity uh, um, services for, for whom exactly? That's right. Um, throughout my career, I've chosen not to niche myself in terms of subject matter. Because I like the variety of uh, just sitting down and designing any number of different things. You know, one one week I could be designing for a social media group. Another week I could be designing for a hospital, schools. So really, any and all that is of interest and, in, you know, uh, we design. Okay, so, so niching down more on like the, the, the type of service you do rather than the type of customers you have. Right. Okay, makes sense. So, and then you're serving the whole Chattanooga area or like even beyond that? Are you yeah. still doing business in Nashville too? I am, yeah. Uh, I actually have customers all over. I've got some in New York, a financial group. Uh, I do work for Pasadena Schools. Oh, uh, cool. Do like work for Pasadena, California? Right. Okay. Yeah, and I'm marketing in Chattanooga and North Georgia. Okay. So that's where I'm concentrating right now. And, uh, you know, it's... It's always a challenge when you're a small group because there's never enough time, you know. So I do outsource a lot of that stuff. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I'm, I outsource almost everything. <laughs> I mean, like uh, industrial automation wise, like I don't have very many uh, like people that work for me directly. Uh, like it's a handful, and then uh, the rest of them, they're all freelancers or like uh, customers or like vendors I work with, you know, mm -hmm. that help me out. Uh, nothing bad about that is, you know, uh, it's keeping keeping the risk low, right? Well, and I think also you really can specialize. You know, you're always utilizing people that are at the top of their game. You know, a lot of the people that I collaborate with have been doing this for years, like 25, 30 years. Right. One of the people I collaborate with uh, worked for Wendy's, and she's really good with strategy and marketing, and I collaborate with her for school systems, for academies and community schools. Okay. So it was uh, also good that you have like insiders, right, from industries that know like the industry from the inside rather than only like, you know, a service provider, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that helped me also like on, on my on my industrial uh, automation business. I come out of the ma manufacturing world, right? So I then at some point just switched the sides, you know, from manufacturing to like the project side and, you know, was a vendor for a long time, still am. Um, but made me understand the insides of a manufacturing business way better than, you know, someone that did projects from the get-go, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I bet, like, if you have, like, uh, people that, you know, you know, know, like, how it works in a big corporation like Wendy's, you know, um, that is a huge benefit for you too, huh? Yeah, I think the corporate experience is huge. I think it, it teaches you how to behave, you know, in those environments. You know, you there's... Yeah enough structure that you learn a lot, you, you can be mentored. I think that's really, really a huge thing to have that as a background. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, um, I'm coming from, from that point too, you know, where 
it was like 10 years for me. It was like a, a huge corporation, Caterpillar, you know, American corporation um, in Germany, though, where, you know, they bought us. You know, we were like a German corporation before that. And uh, after that, we were an American corporation. Then Caterpillar bought us. But the, the structure is always the same. And you can tell like those like Fortune 500 companies, right? They, they know systems, right? And they know how to navigate those systems. And they, um, you know, they might not be so human anymore, right? As like smaller companies, like maybe ours, but they know systems, absolutely. Mm. And if you have someone that knows the insights of that industry or of, you know, corporate, corporate America, if you will, then that's a huge benefit uh, for you to have. Absolutely. Yeah. I started out with uh, Dana Corporation. Okay. So that was automotive. Yeah. Because I was in Ohio. So all the Detroit came down towards. Right. Like Toledo area mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. Yeah. Uh, I have a few customers up there in 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 Ann Arbor and you know like Toledo area, um, Bowling Green up there. It's like, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. It's not as big anymore as it was in the eighties, you know. But it's a lot of a lot of stuff is coming back, you know. Especially like um, Fiat Chrysler, you know, they they invest a lot uh, in like building the trucks again, you know. So that was huge um, coming back the last few years. And then also like the the immobility stuff, you know, it's all going to happen here in mm -hmm. North America. It's not a lot of, still a lot of stuff is outsourced to Mexico, you know, but the, a lot of stuff came back, you know, especially with the new NAFTA deal, you know, for the automotive, that's what, the, here in the United States, it was great. Mm -hmm. That was for a long, long time. I have to say this from, I would say 2015, 16 ish until like almost, yeah, I don't know, 2018 or so. You know, there was not much going on, you know, in investments in automotive. And then suddenly, like, it, it snapped back and, you know, a lot of stuff came back. You know, it's 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 huge in manufacturing. The problem that we have is, like, we had so many manufacturing jobs going overseas and, you know, to Mexico and other countries that we don't have the talent here anymore. So now we're, we're having the jobs back, but they're done by other people. You know, they're done by... 80% of my engineers that I bring in right now for the autom uh, automotive industry, they're from Mexico. Great people. They have the knowledge because they had the business there for a long, long time, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have the talent here anymore. The same, same Europe, you know. Uh, I'm from Germany. Originally, Germany has the same problem. They outsource everything into Eastern Europe. And now that everyone is switching at the same time to e-mobility, they don't have enough talent. So they have to get all the people from, from Eastern, Eastern Europe. Nothing bad about that, you know, but it's like it's kind of funny because we push all those jobs away and all we get them back, but we don't have the people to actually fulfill those jobs. That's, and it takes time. Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of workers don't have mentors. They don't have anybody that has any long-term experience necessarily to help them along. Yeah, that. And then also like understanding systems, right? Coming back to corporations and systems. We, in the automotive industry, we are bound to um, norms, right? Especially when it comes to like recording data and stuff like that. We have uh, ISO 14001. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but, you know, it basically regulates everything. It's like, how do we assume data, right? What kind of data do we have to assume? How, like, how regularly have we uh, um, to be audited and stuff like that? So um, we have principles like 5S, 6S, and all those, you know, it's like, a place for everything and everything in its place, right? It's like just general basic manufacturing like principles and people don't know them. Right. You know, people just don't know them. It's like a huge problem, you know, where, and then it's also like uh, a lot of it is kind of like the states, you know, um, how they like uh, basically give give government grants for retraining of people, right? Uh, we, we had that when we founded our company, um, uh, Pitco, in... 2016 in Charleston, West Virginia, right? So back in the days, like it was like all the coal miners were out of jobs, you know, because, you know, uh, uh, I don't know the, the name of the regulation there, but like they shut down all the coal mines, you know, during the um, uh, Obama Clinton uh, uh, era and they were all out of a job. So I was like, okay, let's retrain them for the automotive industry. We need people, right? We need people. You do have a sense of like, maintenance and you know like the coal miners they had to always like under the the oddest circumstances repair their machinery and everything so they had experience now let's retrain them but the the government was like well we do that we give them money you know it's expensive but we need them to have a job already lined up 
So we actually like there was a huge group in the state of West Virginia Senate and and House of Delegates where we were like, you know what, this is not how that works. It's like I brought like a few HR you know managers from huge corporations. One of them uh, was Gestamp that we have four plants here in Chattanooga too, right? Head of HR North America was here, uh, was there with us, and they was like, hey, you know what? When we when we post a job, we need that to be filled in within a week or two, right? We do not have the time to wait until all this, you know, like approval and gr the government grants and everything goes through and then send them to training for three weeks until all that is through. Yeah. We'll we have, do it for you. we have, we have filled that position five right. times over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but you know, state of West Virginia was like the work for the governor, like the governor, a few of the senators and a lot of the um, house delegates, they were all for it. But the problem was that that was not, um, legislative from from the House or from the Senate or anything. That was just the non, you know, elected entity of Workforce West Virginia. They were like, that's our rules. We're not going to change it. It's like, because we would train everyone and, you know, everyone would be trained and then leave the state. Well, you know, like, you don't attract new jobs coming into the state if you don't, like, you know, why would anyone come with their company to the state if you don't have the workforce for them mm -hmm. why would you why would anyone do that so it's like we ended up like fighting a lot over it and no, nothing ever happened you know and then regulations got changed again so a lot of the coal mines opened back up um never to like the you know their heyday but you know uh, a lot of jobs were created so we kind of scrapped that and we're not in west virginia anymore obviously you know so they didn't want that it's a lot a lot of that going on you know where it's like okay how do we do this this is a bigger project we all have to work together right Chattanooga actually got it right, you know, not perfect, but right, right. The Chattanooga area, you know, when Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen came in, like I don't know, ten years, twelve years ago, something like that, two, uh, 2008, eight, two thousand nine. State of Tennessee was on board. Uh, Chattanooga area was on board. They were like, okay, if you do stuff here, you have to do it locally. You know, create business for local entities. They did that. It's a joint venture between State of Tennessee and Volkswagen Corporation. Um. It can work, right? And then the Gestamp came down here. Then, you know, Tristan came down here. All the other, like, tier one suppliers, they, you know, Magna and all those companies that came down here created so many jobs. But Tennessee was also ready to, like, attract those people, right? Other 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 states are not um, 100% on board with that yet. So. Chattanooga is unique, I think. Yeah, in, in I have that to say that. It really does embrace a lot of progressive ideas. Yeah, yeah. While How still staying, you know, kind of on the path of like being very like uh we don't want anything we don't want much to do with you uh from a you know government business mm -hmm. point of view uh, no state income tax great you know that's attracting a lot of people you know um like you know the internet situation great you know i have never had as fast in, of an internet as here like it's fast internet in the in the whole country and the biking paths well i'm, I'm not amazed. a I, I i bought a bike when i was living <laughs> in chicago you know like because everything is flat, you know? Uh, and then when we moved here a few years ago, we moved to Signal Mountain, and I was like, oh, damn, I can't do that. <laughs> it's like, I'm just not fit yeah. enough for that. Yeah. You know? But I, I bet, like, on the river path and everything. It's, yeah, it's just gorgeous, and it goes for miles. Yeah. You know, it's... It's like, no, it's a really nice place to be. I have to say this. Mm -hmm. We came here, I came, me personally, I came down here uh, 2016 the first time. We built up the... Um, the I think it was the first Gestamp or the second Gestamp plant here uh, on uh, Hickory Valley Road. Um, I was like, well, that's a nice town here. People told me about the internet situation. I was like, oh, you know what? I think that Chattanooga will grow like crazy in the next five years. Mm -hmm. So then I left. Then I came again, actually wanted to move down here with my family in 2017. Um, that didn't really happen. I worked down here, but then, you know, we stayed in West Virginia. Um, said the same thing beautiful you know we looked at a house that we wanted to buy that is funny enough just like uh, we live on the lake now but just i can see the house that we wanted to <laughs> buy back buy back then um from my house now and oh. we didn't even realize until like two weeks ago i was like that's the house look at it we yeah. can see it it's like it's crazy so it was meant to be I and think. it would have been a lot less expensive oh yeah in 17 we had that that house, uh, we looked at it back then. It was like two fifty six, 
like for a house on a lake, 256 year round water with its own dock and everything. Uh, it's not for sale right now, but it would definitely be double or more right now. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So no, like Chattanooga is a very unique place. Yeah, You're it right. is. We really like so, it. and especially for companies like you know, like if you in the in the service industry, right, marketing especially, I think it's going to be great. You know, it's like we choose Dayton. You know, what is just like what like uh, thirty minutes outside of Chattanooga for a reason. I live close by, so I don't have to you know commute a lot. But the other thing is, like, this is a growing area. You know, we're adding manufacturing jobs like crazy. We're adding, you know, internet jobs like cra- data centers. Google is here. I don't know who else is coming. We have, like, huge, uh, you know, Vena Media coming to town a few years back uh, that they, I think they rebranded to, like, Sasha Group, but same owner. You know, there's, there's stuff going on here, mm-hmm. right? And I think give it another, like, right now we're, like, what, like 200,000 people? Give it another five to 10 years, we're going to be 500. You know, this is like exponential growth. Mm-hmm. Um, plus, together with like the, the benefits that you have by just living here, like as a person, no state income tax, nature is just beautiful. A cost of living is still really good. You know, we have to say that even with the housing prices going up, but that's the same, it's the same everywhere, right? It's not only Chattanooga, but like, at the same time, you know, where can you be so close to a somewhat big city but at the same time being like out in nature in like 15, 20 minutes, yeah. right? Yeah. Any place within a half hour here. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Like I said, we lived in Signal Mountain before. You know, it was like just living in the country, but at the same time being like right there. Yeah, I still, when I'm driving, well, in fact, driving here, I just think to myself, wow, I live here. You right. Know, all the mountains and it's just gorgeous. It, it is gorgeous. Yep. I have to say that. And, you know, like there's a lot... To, to to do also like for the kids you know it's like very safe to live here you know it's like i don't know uh we li- like we just moved down here like before we i mean not here but like to tennessee to Ch- the chattanooga area from downtown chicago you know what at the time was like really nice you know but you know look at what happened all in 2020 and stuff like that you know everyone wanted to be away from the city everyone not only us but everyone sold their their apartments uh, uh housing you know Prices went down like crazy. It's it's back up now, but you know, it it's very safe to live here, even in like bad times. You know, um, so weather is nice. Could be less humid sometimes, yeah, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that, it's it's just it's it's nice. So now, you, well, was it this year that you came down here or last mm-hmm. year? In this October. Year? Yeah. So what what's your what's your take on like? The business environment when you like leave your other clients that are in New York and in Nashville out, you think like you you feel it growing here? Or like- yeah, I've I've been here since October and I've um, gained about five new clients. Okay, so it's working. You know, I have maybe a little different method than some companies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just my theory is to just jump in, get to know people. You know, first see how you can help, and it's not all about me try to be authentic. Um, I, you know, I, I have certainly a lot of competition, but, but then I sort of don't, you know, I feel like, uh, I've been doing this for so long that I understand service and, uh, a lot of people say they can do things, don't necessarily deliver. Right. So, uh, you know, I show up and I do more than I should and, um, I deliver. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, it's that simple. Have, I mean, that's it's that simple, <laughs> right? No, the the whole competition thing, I, I don't see it that way either. You know, it's like for me, it's more. I don't see the world as that place, right? It's like it's very abundant, right? Every mm-hmm. there's so much business right now, like everywhere, right? If you see it that way, and you're more like open minded and say, hey, you know what? Yeah, well, we're in the same space, but re- what we really are more like collaborators than like the hard competition. Right. You know, I bet there's people out there that see it that way, you know, and they, they are successful too. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't see it that way. I know, like you said earlier, you know, I know I can't do it all. So I have to outsource, Mm -hmm. right? Why would I like get into beef with anyone that I really need, right? Well, and the cool thing is that as I'm networking, you know, certainly I'm looking for business opportunities, but at the same time, I'm finding all these great resources that I can 
collaborate with. And, and I've found from a marketing standpoint that, that you multiply yourself out considerably when you do that, yeah. because a lot of these people that I utilize, they also utilize me when they have projects. So you sort of create these emissaries that work when you're not out there, you know, peddling the streets. So exactly. Yeah. It, it's a good way to market, I think. Right. It's like, it's not only the marketing part of this, it's just also the personal relationships that you build. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, yes, I'm in the B2B space with both of my businesses, but is there really such thing as B2B? I don't see it that way, right? It's always like business to a person or person to a person, right? right. It's, it's all about the personal relationships that you have with people. And even if there's nothing happening right now, like I have sales cycles sometimes, they run two years, four <laughs> years, right? It's like first yeah. contact to final sale or not final sale, but like the first sale to first service uh, 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 gig two years, three years, four years, it, you know, what I did in the meantime was like, always like, Hey, I'm not, I'm still here, still in business. If you need me, I'm here. You know, mm -hmm. they have a question. I help them for free. Right. If I can solve a problem and within five minutes, I'm not going to charge you for that. Right. You know, it doesn't matter if I could or not, I'm not going to charge you for that. If I can like solve a problem from here on my phone, you send me a picture and I tell you exactly what your problem is and solve it, that's not worth charging for, yeah. right? But they will remember. They're going to be like, oh my God, all that at no charge? Yeah, that's a favor. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. It's just being human. Right. But a lot of people are not like that. They're like, okay, uh, they might, I have had people that I knew that could solve my problem in five minutes without, you know, doing anything or not much. They were like, no, you know what? Uh, I can come out, estimate, and all that kind of stuff. I even had people like offering to my, not to me directly, but to my clients through me. They would come out, look at stuff, and give an estimate, cost them $2,000 to come out and do the estimate. I was like, you know what? I will never call you again. I will not present that to anyone. You don't charge for estimates. What is wrong with you? <laughs> It's like, so you charge for something. It's like, here's what that would cost, you know, when I do it to you. But for me to tell you that, I want $2,000 from you. And how do they do that? Like, I don't know. Like, who would do that? I don't understand how they get customers that way. I don't know. So I know that, you know, some, and that's, 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 the, that's the huge problem there. It's like some, some companies, especially when it comes to like machine builders and stuff like that, they have a, a sole proprietary uh, product that they're used to that. They're charging rates that I could never charge for, for the same service because I don't have a proprietary product, even though I can fix that product too, right? Um, but they, they're so used to that. They're just like, yeah, we have a service contract, uh, $170 an hour. It was like, well, what are, you, are you spinning gold for them? What, what is it you do? It was like, why would you do that? Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, we can come out and like give you an estimate on a service that we then make money on $170 an hour, uh, cost you, you know, travel costs and all that kind of stuff. It's like, well, like I could never do that. I travel to customers just to look at stuff, cost me $1,200 to fly there, you know, look at it and whatever, my time, you know. And then they're sometimes like, no, sorry. It was not the price, you know, not even that. It, it was not. Someone else solved the problem like internally for them. I'm never going to go there and charge them for anything. It's the cost of doing business. Exactly. So, yeah. the, the, you know, that's like, why would you do that? I would never buy, if I don't have to, I will never buy anything to, from you. And that's a huge part of also like my, like a lot of the clients that I had back in the days when I was still working for someone else are now my clients because I've never treated them like that. Never. I would come out, I would just like, hey, you know what? Um, call me on the weekend, no problem. You know, send me a WhatsApp, whatever. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, I did that for free. My boss always said, don't do that. Charge them for that. And I was like, no, I'm not going to charge them for that. It's like, they're going to do business with us based on that. A year later, they have like, um, so once a year, they had like uh, all the clients come in and then they have this like summit or whatever. And then the clients can say, this is good, this is bad. This is, you know, kind of like a feedback round. So, and they, they, the clients here in the United States, they said that, you know, we really didn't like your service in the United States, but that new guy you have, he's great. Well, did I give everything away for free? No. 
but the stuff that I can help with mm -hmm. for f five minutes, right? Why would I charge you for that? Right. You know, like until that goes through the process and I get a PO for that, that problem is solved. Like it's not worth it. It's like, you know, the overhead that comes with it to like actually issue a PO for something like that. Even writing the quote, mm -hmm. you know, the quote, no one pays us for me typing in the quote, right? But like the five minutes, but the business that that brought us in later on, if if you don't think like that, then you, you know, you shouldn't be in the service industry. Well, and back to referrals, nobody's going to refer somebody that does that. Right. Because it makes them look bad. The only reason they get business is because they have a proprietary product. That's all it is. If they wouldn't have the product, or if someone finds the product that re replaced this, a generic one, you're out of business. Or you like you're dropping so much in, in, in revenue, you know, because like suddenly your proprietary servers, they buy the product from you, but then everything afterwards is not you anymore. The aftermarket, you know, if they have to buy a part that is uh you have a pattern on and you have they have to go through you, then yes. But everything else comes from someone else. So it's like hurting yourself. You could have a lot of little bit of business, but you choose to have one time bigger business. But if you like calculate that against each other, you're not that high ticket either to actually, um, you know, make up for that. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people don't understand that. And like I said, especially in service after sales, stuff like that, the, the customer service that comes after the actual sale is the personal relationship you build with your client. Right. Because if you don't develop that personal relationship, you don't have enough information or you certainly can use that information to help you better serve them. Right. And so you have to have that kind of relationship, I think, in order to do the best job. Well, right. And you need the data from that too. That's right. You know, so without data, I think, especially in service and, you know, you don't know what works and what doesn't. If you don't have the data from, you know, your successful sales, from your non-successful sales and from your, you know, customer complaints. You know, I always like, if someone calls me and says, hey, this wasn't right, this wasn't good because of X, Y, Z, I appreciate that a lot because I'm never going to make that mistake again. You know, sometimes people just like to complain. I get that too. You know, I'm from Germany. They do that all day long. Um, but like, the, yeah, really. So it's culturally. <laughs> uh, but, you know, sometimes it's just feedback for you and you should take this because it can improve your business. Therefore, you know, improve their life. Take, take as much pain away from your clients as possible. You know, that's why we built this here in the way we build it. Our clients don't have to do anything. They come in, sit down, do what we do, right? Talk about, you know, whatever they want to talk about, their products, their services, their culture, you know, just small talk, whatever, and then leave and we do all the rest, no pain at it, right? Actually, we take everything away. If you come and tell me this part of the service I don't like because of X, Y, Z, I will consider changing that either for everyone or at least just for you. You know, if that is a pain point for you, mm -hmm. that's not going to be a pain point for you anymore tomorrow. But that's only possible with data. I saw a great quote this week, and, and it's something that I know, but I sort of lost sight of. And the quote was, um, don't sell your product, sell the problem that you solve. Exactly. That's, that's, that's deep. And, you that's know, exactly it. When you, especially when you network, the inclination is just to say, me, 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 this is what I do, this is... Right. But really, you should be not necessarily saying that, at least at the onset. I mean... Find like, out what, what, what isn't working. You know, how can I help you? How can I make your, make your life easier? Greatest, one of the greatest advertisers in the world, Apple, right? Go through their advertisements. You know, they, they don't do many. They don't do many. They do a few a year. That's it, right? When their new products come out, try to find the ad where they talk about their product. You will not find it. They never talk about the product. They always talk about the person that that product is for. Mm -hmm. You know, what you can do, like, you know, what the person wants to do, you know, that is the product for that. They never talk about the product. It's all, always about the, you know, all about the misfits, you know, that think differently. It's not, you know, you're describing what, who that product is for rather than the product itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Apple especially, like people know what, they, what they're capable of, right. right? So, but it that is something to be taken away from the whole 
strategy that didn't change since the 80s, right? It was never about the product. It was about the customers, mm -hmm. right? And especially in like in marketing, in modern day marketing is in particular, right? Where like everyone has the, the option now to get in front of as many people as they want, right? It's not limited anymore. I mean, it takes a while. It's a lot of work, but you know, you can, if you want, like you, you can make 3 billion people, you know, know your face, you know, if you, if you do it the right way. That's about the, the amount of people that have access to internet right now. Does, did anyone ever reach that goal yet? No, but it's possible. Like technically it's there, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, if we take the countries out that like sense or, you know, and you, you can't reach YouTube or Facebook or stuff like that, but there's mm -hmm. ways to do that in those countries too. It's possible. The, the vehicles that are, that are used and the, like you said, this like me, 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 right? It's like all about me. It's about me. I want, I have this product. I, the only thing I want is your money. That is that is a big problem. I think it should be about them, them, them. And then I hear you. I feel your pain. I know your pain. I take it away. So Well, in that me, me, me mentality, I think it'll get you a job. It might get you a contract short term, but I don't think it lasts. I think that it, it comes through. That Well, I mean, the, yes. Long term, I think people that solve problems and have the customer, you know, customer center, right? In mind, they're always going to do better. But that's all. There's also like you know exceptions to that rule because you know what it boils down to is also like a huge, a huge deal of like how good are they in sales, right? I can have the best product in the world. If I can't sell, then you know I'm going to be out of business. Mm -hmm. I'm super uh, customer centric and I do everything. I feel your pain. I know everything, you know, uh, you, you know, you feel as like a, a pain, but if I don't have the means to actually sell that to you, then those people are going to go out of business too. Mm -hmm. So that's a, it's a, it's a very huge problem for a lot of people because, you know, depending on the industry you're in, you know, you're, you're creative, right? I'm an engineer. Uh, but now you have to, to make the you know the next step to like okay i'm a creative i'm a business owner i'm a i'm an engineer i'm a i don't know what you are right but are you a business person are you a salesperson a lot of people and i see that especially with my creative team they're kind of introvert you know they're great on paper or they're great on you know digital canvases and stuff like that but they're still kind of introverts and now if you're a freelancer that might be a problem because you know word of mouth and everything is great if you want to scale, you need a sales skill, the business person skill. Yeah, I agree. So that's a that, that's a very huge problem for a lot of people. All right. So um, I also see here that um, you do um, make a lot of contributions to community organizations like. Uh, Harpeth uh, Conservatory, mm -hmm. 50 Forward, Benton Hall Academy, et cetera. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, again, it's I feel like I need to give back and to get involved in the community. Um, I've sat on a few boards. I had four going at once and dropped that. It was too much. But Okay. Um, yeah, I I like to do a certain amount of in-kind for nonprofits. I, when I first moved here, I contacted the... Uh, uh, um, the the North Neighborhood House, okay, North Side Neighborhood House. I never heard of that. They're downtown, uh, on Minor Avenue. Anyway, they have about seven community schools, and they have a thrift shop, and they just they're basically their mission is to help educate people to help themselves. Yeah, and they were they're just celebrating their hundred year anniversary coming up, and so I'm helping them with their logo and their um cool design work so that's all like as a favor yeah yeah i do that yeah. uh, I, I do that a lot too we have like a we have a business um, organization here in town you know like we have this like historic downtown dayton uh, it's called main street dayton so um we will do like a um, you know kind of little advertisement video for them uh for their i think it's a pumpkin fest or something like that you know uh, uh it's going to be in october you know 
we do stuff like that or you know we we sponsor the local uh, uh the county fishing team the, the youth fishing team you know also have my number one salesperson on the team my son you know <laughs> uh, uh they have the first tournament on saturday um the so do that you know or like you know a sponsor like the um the like a meal for i think it's a local high school band you know for for their football team stuff like that yeah it's you important know? it's important to give back and that's how you really get to know people on sort of a different level absolutely and absolutely. for me in a new community i have to show people what i can do and right uh when i first moved to nashville i came from well ohio knoxville nashville uh i had all autom automotive stuff industrial strength yeah. design and they just couldn't relate to it it was very hard to get work right uh, but once i started you know i did a few in kind nonprofits and you know people got to know me and and that that helps you know and then i did my branding marketing my brand and then people you know when i'd introduce myself they'd say oh i've heard of you you know and so anyway yeah the in kind is very important to me yeah i think everyone should do that right uh, i say it all the time i repeat myself you know medical probably don't want to hear it anymore so if you don't have anything to give you will never receive anything that's it's so important that people understand this you know plus like the power of uh, 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 reciprocity you know it's like so so big that you know people absolutely under underestimate this you know give give first and then you you will receive absolutely. later absolutely so yeah. it's it's very important i think a lot of small business owners they're like yeah but you know i'm not there yet it costs you nothing it costs you right. a little bit of your time that's, that's all right. right volunteer somewhere Make yourself known, you know. Be part of a member, like a member of a chamber of commerce or something like that. So, we're a member here in Dayton. We're going to be a member in uh, uh, Chattanooga. We're going to be a member in 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 the Cleveland, you know. And also, like, of course, we offer our services to them too. But you know, I because I have a personal interest in the region, you know, growing. Yeah, I chip in too. You know, it's like I do like a an in kind, if you will, you know, a huge donation, a few thousand dollars a month, right? So that's something where it it costs that costs me money, right? So, but like most of the stuff that I do is like, if I sponsor a meal for the local football uh, uh, football band, you know, high school band, uh, that's five hundred dollars. But I get in front of a lot of people that will remember that, you know, it's just a you know an act of kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, basically it's like okay, I, I get it. You know, they need to eat. They stay over from school, and you know the football football team comes in um in the evening and they play the game and it's, yeah here's some food you know there's no logo of mine or anything they mention me but that's all you mm -hmm. know that's fine i don't need you know people to come and thank me for it yeah it's just it's just good a good way, way to be i think yeah be part of the community right you know yeah. that's especially when you're new you know no one right. knows me here yeah well i started out when we first moved here i didn't join the chattanooga chamber but they have councils all over chattanooga which are pretty amazing because you can fill your schedule with different councils all over the city. So I started doing that. And then I did join the chamber, the Catoosa County chamber. And, um, everybody's just been, you know, really kind and helpful. And I can't say enough about the community really. It, everyone, that, like everyone, everyone that comes in here says the same thing. All small business owners, some of them new to town, uh, like me, like you, uh, you know, other people that I had on the podcast so far came from like North Carolina, Ohio, like all over the place say the same thing. Like, this is cool. This is like, and it's not only like that here. It's not special to Chattanooga. It's like, if you do it that way, you know, get in front of people, especially small business owners, you know, they all struggled in the beginning too. They know how it is. Most of them, at least, right? They know how that is, and they like they would have been happy if someone would have helped them, right? You just have to like get the word out. You're here. I help. You help. Whatever. Like I said, I tell everyone my problems if they want to hear it or not. Right? It's not complaining. It's just yeah, you know, we're encountering this problem right now. People that have nothing to do with my problem or my business or anything, and they're like, you know what? I know someone that might have a solution. Let me call. Here's here's the number. Yeah, you know that is like one one person helps another. Right. Even if they don't have any 
uh, monetary benefits from it. You know, there is a benefit to them too because they're like, you know what? I introduced that person to you. I just did you a huge favor. You will remember that next time you need anything that I do or send someone else my way. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a reciprocity. Is yeah, just it just like multiplies big. out. You know, when you think about your personal and professional network and you, you know, that just keeps radiating out. It's, it's amazing how well it works. Yes. If you just put yourself out there. Yeah, absolutely. It's like I have always been a people's person. I have to say that. I'm a Gemini, you know, like I just like, you know, I'm nowhere near what you would call an introvert. All right. Been like that since I'm a kid. Uh, didn't serve me so well in school or uh, even in my like uh, first career, to be honest. But, you know, I never had problems networking. Right. Um, but when I when it clicked with me, where it's like, OK, so now I'm a business owner, um, already semi successful back then. What am I doing now? What am I doing to get in front of more people? Well, meet more people, right? It's like networking events. We're like members of the chambers, like I said. We're even member of the German American Chamber of Commerce, right? So I, because I have like things in common with people that, you know, they're expats, you know, I, I have been through the whole deal, right? Now, my company is a 100% American owned company. I founded it here, it's mine. We're opening up a branch this year in Europe. This is like American company goes to Europe. It's not, it was never a thing in Germany. What I do here, I, that was my, I have a degree in that and, and all that kind of stuff. I have over 25 years of experience in that now, but it was never my wish to have this kind of boring company, right? It's like, it was, I, like I had companies before, but they were all kind of glamorous, you know, like event business, um, band management and stuff like that. You know, what you, what you like as a, you know, 20 year old or what? Uh, never in the actual field that I'm in since, like I said, since almost 25 years now. But that was okay. Now I know it. Like I'm a different person. Now I'm like, I went ballistic on LinkedIn last year. I had 300 connections, all people that I personally know. And I was like, okay, so this is actually great. I post something, almost all of my connections can see that. And they tell me that they saw it. They even tell me exactly what, like how many people of those people that saw my post have the job description as like CEO, salesperson. I was like, that's great. Let's do something with it. So I just blew this up where like just short of 8,000 uh, wow. followers. So, and then just like I said, like in a little bit over a year that I've like really ramped it up now. That was all part of the journey of like when we founded Mapeos for to, just to run the in-house marketing for Pitco, what is the industrial automation company. How can I grow this? How can I get in front of as many people as possible with content rather than ads, mm -hmm. right? I'm not big on ads. Like I think my ad spend last year was $0. This year, I think I spent for the grand opening here, I spent $300 so far. We're going to ramp this up now because we have the resources to actually follow through on this. But like I said, like to this point, all growth is all organic. You know, we just figured out a way how to do it. And now what I, for what I need, it's exactly that. For the marketing company, I need to add uh, the ads to it because, you know, we uh, we reach different people differently, right? right. So this is more bro a broader, you know, it's not so niche anymore than the industrial automation field. Um, but it's still not super broad. We're not doing like direct to consumer, like B2C. You know, we don't have a product that, is like highly scalable or whatever, but we also don't have high risk. So we do B two B. It it you know that it's it's different. You know I don't have to deal with like people complaining about price and stuff like that. They want value. If I can deliver this and the quality is fine, then you know they're gonna give you the money. No questions asked. Yes, you have to wait thirty days in in some cases or some cases even sixty. But other than that, it's I I'd rather do this than B two C. Yeah. Absolutely. So all businesses except one startup that I helped building was uh, B two B. You know, I don't want, I don't want to do B two C anymore. So how many people do you have developing content? So right now with six, we have another person coming tomorrow, and we're still hiring. So we. So that's how you were able to ramp up so fast. Yeah. So we're like the. I founded my first business 
as a free, I called it a business. It was never that. It was a job, right? I was a freelancer. I had job. I had a job. You know, basically making the money, chasing the money, making the money, chasing the money, right? It was always cycles. It was an up and down and like a roller coaster, awful, right? A lot of stress on me, a lot of stress on the family, a lot of stress on like the marriage and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, almost went bankrupt in the beginning of uh, 2020, you know, during like COVID and stuff like that when the whole shutdown was there. So I took a job, like a real like W2 job. Um, hated it. Like hated it. Same space. Really good money. Really good money. I was not taking a, a huge pay cut from freelancer to, to that job, right? But they, I just hated it. I hated the man I worked for. Sorry. Um, but, you know, I just, you know, we will probably be good friends now because, you know, we don't work together anymore. But I just hated the situation. Um, quit the job in the midst of the pandemic. Just like, you know what? Done. My wife looked at me like, what? Are you crazy? Like, there's nothing out there. Well, I picked up the phone and called people, you know, and, and, and discovered that most of the people that I would like to work for right now, they don't have anything to do. What they needed was salespeople. So what I did was like, okay, so you have all the people sitting around there. Can I sell them for you? Yes. What I did was like, I didn't sell them for them. I sold them for myself. Just, you know, kind of outsource this. Leverage was when it clicked where I was like going from a freelancer, almost going bankrupt beginning of 2020 to 400% growth of my best year in just six months. So I didn't, you know, just the business alone went from a little bit over 100K in 2019 to over 400K in 2020, just by, you know, and I'm talking profit. I'm not talking, uh, uh, you know, gross revenue. That was like, that blew my mind. I was like, okay, I did, I did it all wrong before. From there on, you know, went like that, like crazy. You know, uh, 2021 doubled. 2022, we're probably going to uh, one and a half X that. Now with this, with the marketing company in the back, and, you know, uh, we're hiring more people. We have an office manager already. We're hiring CTO. We're hiring uh, engineering manager. We're going to be at 10X end of next year. So that's the, right. that's the plan. So. Mm-hmm leverage so what i did was the marketing company now that we relaunched i was like i'm not going to do that i'm not going to do exactly what i did with the other one where i'm like trying to make it myself because now i have the other people working for me using leverage there but i'm not using it here how how stupid could i be so i didn't so the first thing i did was like hiring people getting the office building here and to be honest like i couldn't do this alone that impossible right i'm still running the other business like I said, I'm I'm flying out like in a few hours from now, not being here. Uh, the the, re- the rest of this week, not going to be here next week. Uh, a few days left in in September that I'm actually going to be here without them. There's not going to be a business. So leverage from from day one. Mm-hmm. That's the that's that's the way to go. You know, we will be at capacity here. So when we have uh, 30, 30 clients ish, when we um, uh, utilizing the podcast and everything, like the the actual like uh, social media marketing strategies that we built here, uh, the service tiers that we have, thirty, and then we're at capacity. We cannot do any more. Then we have to build either a new building, or we just you know stay there. Mm-hmm. But you know we also do brand deals, right? We do you know a lot of like work for bigger brands, and that's the goal, anyways. You know, like with the other company, eighty percent of my clients are. Um, Fortune 500 companies, right? The the huge automotive companies and such. I want to I want to have those companies. You know, it's easier easier business. I have to say that I know the in, uh, I know the insights of the you know of the corporations. We talked about that earlier, and it's like we they will never get in trouble financially. Those companies they don't get in trouble. Like you don't have to worry about like is that is that person still going to be in business in a year from now? Can he pay me? Or, or she or the, the corporation or whatever I you know I love small business I want to help and that's why we structured all this but like they, it's way easier to do business with like Fortune 500 companies than with small business well, they have budgets right that also <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know big budgets I mean we're probably never going to land Coca-Cola I mean never say never knock on wood but like you know there's a middle way right where 
you, and you name it, it's, it's the budget, right? But what's at stake for them also? So they have to have a huge budget because if someone screws up for them, right. you know, what's at stake, right? Are they, brand recognition goes through, like, you know, goes in the gutter because someone screwed up at like XYZ company. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. Can't do that. It's too much, too much on the line for them. You're in a good space though, because you're not so huge that you've got massive amount of overhead to deal with. No, it's, it's, and so it's okay. I, I've, have found with my company that um, agencies a lot of times don't have the person do the work that's the most experienced. Yeah. Do you get it's a manager? based on budget. It's a manager then. <laughs> and so uh, they don't, they're not necessarily getting the best resource, even though they're paying the big bucks. Right. But it's, it's like that everywhere. So, what happens all the time, I see that all the time, right? Especially, like, you know, it doesn't matter the, the industry. It really doesn't. You know, it doesn't matter. If you find someone that is really good at their job, they're going to be managers afterwards. That means, like, well, there's some... Germany was different. In Germany, like, if you had someone that was really good, you, that person would never be promoted. Because, you know, they know if we do that, we, we don't have a worker that can fill up for that one. Uh, 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 you know, like fill in for that one. But, you know, that's also kind of like an, a butthole move from the manager to not do that because, you know, actually that person deserved that, right? But you're right. You know, it's like you have a very experienced graphic designer, right, in a company, especially agencies that grow like crazy. That person gets promoted to be manager or even like manager's manager or, you know, like grows, like gets like stakeholder and whatever. The talent is gone, you know, and then you get another 20 year old. No offense, but, you know, there's a huge difference between a, you know, no matter what industry, no matter what, you know, a someone that has two years experience or someone that has 20, right? Um, sometimes that is, is not beneficial because, you know, you're like this you know, you have like the, the blindfolds on when you're like too long in the industry. Not everyone, but it can happen where you're like, you're not at the pulse of time anymore, right? We had that in the industrial automation uh, uh, um, space very often where it was like, oh, we did that like that for 40 years. Why would we change this, right? There you have a lot of experience, but no innovation anymore. And they, there's a small, small line there in between those two where you're like, okay, we need the experience, but at the same time, we need those people to still be open-minded, to be innovative, right? Same with, same with marketing. You know, if you don't stay at the pulse of time, you're going to be outdated next week. This is changing so rapidly. Mm. We sometimes have like algorithm changes on those like social media platforms. Like they have, you don't even, they don't tell you, you know, sometimes they tell you, but mostly they don't even tell you, you have to find out. So if you don't, if you're not an active member of that, you know, society, then it's it, it's gonna uh, get uh, it's going south very quickly. Well, that's why I use people that know that right now and can help with that. Because as an owner, you can't keep up with that. No, no. I look. I, I own two companies now. Yeah. You know, I can't do that. I need people, especially younger people, right? Where I'm like, I'm not old, right? I know that, but for them, I am. Double H, <laughs> double in H. But then again, like, I'm, you know, I'm just like hybrid generation where we grew up without all that, especially in Germany. Like our, we were behind when it comes to like innovations, when it comes to internet and all that kind of stuff. When we had like dot-com bubble here in the, uh, in 2000, I didn't even really understand what the internet was, you know, and I was already 20 back then. So I mean, we had an internet connection, but it was still like a 56K modem. You know, it's like very slow and all that kind of stuff. I've never really used email at that time. You know, internet really became something that I could like understand and grasp in 2004. So that was already like here after like the first like crash, right? So, but you know, those guys... They grew up with that. Right. So they were probably had an iPhone when they were three or so. Mm -hmm. You know, so um that's that's different. We need we need younger people than the new generation to come in and fill in and you know, give me their expertise, you know. And I always like everyone 
I want everyone to speak up. All right. So because they know better, I know that. So now I have experience. I'm open minded. Let's merge that mm -hmm. because otherwise, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make it. Yeah, I, th I think it just applies to pretty much every, every type of person. The more input you get, the better off you're gonna be. Everybody has their their perspective. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's like, like I said, I'm having a totally different upbringing than most of the people in this country, right? I'm from Europe. I came over here when I was 33 already, right? For good at 35. You're never going to get the German out of me anymore, right? I'm That's done, right? I can adapt and everything. I'm still culturally different. Um, like I said, like I, I did adapt a lot. You know, uh, my wife is American, you know, our two older kids, they're American. So that helps. But, you know, I have a totally different perspective on things than most people I meet here in the United States. And that's okay. Mm. You know, uh, there's also a lot of value to be brought, you know, in some aspects, right? Especially in the industrial world, because we do things differently over there. We still have, you know, the expertise that is missing here. That is a huge benefit for me right now. But uh, at the same time, when it comes to like anything creative, I'd rather say nothing than, you know, taking the leap all the time because they know better culturally. Um, my wife, she's like a creative director here. So like she knows way better how to navigate culture here than I do. And I will ever do because, you know, I'm not from here. So, but, you know, this, this all comes together and, you know, I think creates something that we have, you know, we have a unique selling point um, against other companies because they don't have that you know, they have a different fabric, mm -hmm. you know, they might have people from, from, from another country or, you know, I don't know. It's like, it, it's, it's a lot of stuff that comes together that like, you know, basically creates this very unique fabric and culture of each and every company. And, you know, and then the clients have to decide, right. Yep. Does this fit in with my values? That's right. Right. And that's also a huge, uh, a huge thing. What I think is why, like the content marketing that we do, like kind of stuff like this, you know, people listening in with us, that makes a difference because people now know what's going on and some sometimes understand better that they want that or understand better that they don't want it, right? Because the values don't match up. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge. And it's like, we have never been in a situation like that ever before. You know, I mean, just think 20 years back, right? 2002. Well, you could advertise, you know, via email. I don't know, was was MySpace already around? I don't know. I, I don't think. But, you know, you could do that, but no one really knew you, right? And it was very expensive still to get in front of people. Still way cheaper than like just five years before that. But, you know, where are we now? Where basically anyone in the world can start a small business like based on internet. Like I can get right. as uh, in front of as many people as Coca Cola if I want, if I have the skills, if I, without paying a dime. We have never been in a situation like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's, uh, it is. It's yeah. remarkable. I think it's like we taken away a lot of power from from corporations like that. Like the little guy uh, suddenly can be as big as you as a corporation, depending on you know. Right. Like if they if they have if they align their values with enough other people. It's about that. But how would you know? I bet there were a bunch of other people out there before too, like in the 80s and 90s and whatever, where they just didn't have the means to get in front of mm -hmm. enough people. Yeah. So, very exciting time. Um, well, thank you so much for being on here with us. Um, sorry for the delay in the thank beginning. You. Uh, we really appreciated you being here. I would really like you to maybe sometimes come back, you know, and we talk again how Chattanooga treated you maybe in a year from now or so. Um, and then also, like like I said, we're always open for collaborations. You know, we're always looking for people that can, yeah. you know, uh, basically complement our strength, you know, and the other way around. Yeah, likewise. Because this is when I'm meeting all these new people and companies, you know, I'm definitely thinking in terms of not just my business, but how we can collaborate. Right. And I, that's exactly how I do it all the time. You know, for me, it's like every person I'm, I meet is like a, 
an extension of my of my product and services, basically, right? I mean, not everything, but you know, a lot of a lot of times, a lot of times. And if not that, then at least like my network is bigger. That if someone else out of my network needs help with something that I can't just fulfill, right? I'm just gonna send them. Yeah, to it's, someone else. it's strange how that works. I mean, you know, you just keep collecting. Yeah, it's and a huge. You can sort of be like a. Well, that's, I mean, even. for us, it's like, it's, it's two things, right? It's my personal network, me, Mike Peters, as a person, take the business person out, right? I just love being around people. Then it's my business network where it's like, okay, Mike Peters as a person, the network goes into two companies or eventually three, four, five, six, whatever. But then at the same time, it's also like, okay, it's a huge database of people like you, for example, that are willing to come on a podcast and talk to someone that they never met before. We can, you know, one of our, like, we build a big database of people that are, you know, open-minded and, you know, want to network and stuff like that, that we then can, you know, connect to our clients. It's like, hey, you know what? You don't have to do all that. Hmm. We do all that for you. We take that pain away from you too. Because a lot of people come to me and it's like, yeah, well, that's cool. Where you get all those guests from, right? I was like, well, they're out there. You know, if you go with us, they're all your guests, right? Because I know that people, if it aligns with values, correct, right? Uh, if there's someone that you just, you know, you're not feeling it, right? Then not. But usually, I mean, people that are open-minded like us, they're like, they click because they have the same values, right? Um, pe people that would go that route of content marketing in that style, they're all going to click because they all want the same thing, networking. Right. Well, and for instance, in my, I have a little group that I go to on Wednesdays, which is a fantastic group in Georgia. And uh, there was a gal that came in, and she is now the executive director for a small little museum. And I happen to know a person that handles, and she's international. She helps marketing and strategy for museums and amusement parks all over the world. And so I basically connect the two of them and people do that for me too. So it's just, yeah, it's the way to do business. It, it, exactly. So there's no, there's no minds, 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 you know, this is like, it, it's just a bad habit. And I think also like, uh, had a lot to do with like, um, you know, the, the media, the media environment that we were living in until like just 10 years ago, you know, where, you know, everyone was like using elbows all the time. That's the way to go. You have to be the hardest one. Don't let anyone like steal your, you know, steak from your plate, whatever. That's just not how the world is anymore. Right. Because now it's not big corporations in charge anymore. It's the little guys. Right. Yeah, we have still have the big corporations, but they have to like pivot also. Otherwise, they will be. Um, people don't like that. All right, especially like um, the younger generations. They don't like harsh. They don't like mean. They want you know all roses and sun and rainbows. You know, it's like uh, well, understandable. At the same time, it's like why not being nice to each other? Right. There's enough business for everyone. Yeah, I think it comes down to just being authentic. Well, that too. I mean, right. people are looking for that, especially after COVID. Right. But like, you know, there's authentic mean, <laughs> you know. Well, that's like, true. Yeah. <laughs> you have those people <laughs> who, I'm very authentic. I'm just an asshole. You know, it's like, <laughs> so that's, you know, that, there's that too. But, yeah, that's true. So that's, you know, but w what I think is this, like this internet thing, and we're not, we're just started. Like we just started really. Like if you look at like how long we have TVs, how long we have the radio, still around, by the way. How long we have, you know, other m forms of media and how young the internet still is. Especially, like, really accessible to everyone, right? We're talking about the last 10 years. Before that, it was still kind of like a luxury good, right? Today, the last 10 years, it's really like anyone can have it. Anyone, mm. right? If you don't have the money to own your own cell phone or your internet, you know, at home... Go to your local church. Or library, yeah. Library, stuff like that. Everyone can have internet now. Well, we're talking United States or Europe, right? 
Um, I know there's still countries where there's not 100% coverage yet, but it, it yeah, it's 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 accessible. And the little guy doesn't want mean people, you know, at least most people. Mm -hmm. Like I said, thank you very much no, for being you. here. I don't want to be rude, but, you know, pleasure. I have uh, a, a lot plane. of stuff to do <laughs> <laughs> and I have to fly out uh, tonight. So um, great getting to know you. Yeah. Same. Um, good to meet you too. Uh, like I said, let's stay in contact. I'm pretty sure there's there's some collaboration coming out of this. Absolutely. Um, you know, if you uh, you know send your contact information, like the whole deal, to to Ashlyn, she can forward that to me. Okay. Um, or just answer to that uh, calendar invite that you got. There's my email in there too. Then you know uh, we have to you know yeah we'll put you in the database anyways. Like I said, and then you know, you might get requests to be on other people's podcasts too. And then you decide if you want it or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. This has been great. Thanks. All right. Appreciate Thank it. you so much.